Thank you for listening to this message from Choose Life Youth. For more information about Choose Life Church, Choose Life Youth Church, and Dean Shropshire Ministries, visit us online at ChooseLifeHobs.com. Now prepare your heart for the word. You can go ahead and open up your Bible tonight. Our series... And I'm going to ask you, I know it's super exciting and we're getting a gift and all that, but if we could just be quiet, that would be great. So open up your Bible to John chapter three. And if you're still talking, if you would just stop talking, that would be so awesome. John chapter three. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 16. I want you to write this statement down. We all have the same gift. And so real quick, once we're done um, passing out gifts, if we're leaders, y'all listen, I love you. And I'm about to make it your worst Christmas if you don't be quiet. Okay? And I'm not threatening you. I'm just telling you this is a house of order because this is God's house. And I've already said nicely twice. And so it's just, at this point, it's immature. Don't act like that. John 3, 16, write it down in your notes. We've all been given the same gift. We've all been given the same gift. Now, this is so important because... Over the last several weeks, we've been talking in our series called The Language about how things shift based on different cultures and customs and even in different parts of the world, things are done differently. For example, let me talk a little bit about Christmas in different countries. In Italy, La Bifana, the female witch, like Italian equivalent of Santa Claus, flies around on a broomstick and in Italy, so delivers candy to the nice or cold to the naughty. So basically, in Italy for Christmas, you get candy. In Estonia, apples. You get apples, you get nuts, you get cookies, or other treats are given to children during holidays. Get this, Scotland does not celebrate Christmas at all. If you live in Scotland, no Christmas. The celebration of this holiday was banned in 1958. That's where some of you are going to go that don't stop talking to Scotland. And that's how you're going to have the worst Christmas ever. Um, In the small country of Luxembourg, on the eve of St. Nicholas Day, children put plates on the table. So no stockings, no tree, but plates on the tables. St. Nicholas fills with sweets and treats, basically candy. Let's see, in France, this one's interesting. Children put their shoes in front of the fireplace. Now, how many would just like, my shoes smell? Do you know what I mean? Like, here's the deal. You get your presents in your shoes. And if your shoes smell, I don't know what you do because I don't live in France. But in France, children put their shoes in front of the fireplace or by the Christmas tree for Father Christmas to fill with presents, sweets. I mean, how many of you would put the biggest shoe ever? Like if all I get is what fits in my shoe, I want to borrow like clown shoes or somebody's shoes that's like, whose foot in here is a size six? Is anybody a size six? That's me. That's a small, okay, not very many. We don't get any Christmas, basically. Nothing will fit in our shoe. So you would want the biggest shoe. Okay, let's see. In Iceland, y'all listen to this one. This will be the last one. In Iceland, books are the single most popular Christmas gift. The other place all the bad kids of this youth ministry are going to go because probably nobody wants a book for Iceland. So please be quiet so we don't put you on a plane and say Merry Christmas in Iceland. The Books are the primary gift in Iceland. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to let you open that gift that you have in just a couple minutes. But obviously, we all know John 3, 16, but I want you to put your eyes on it. And I want you to follow along as I read. For God so loved the world that he gave what? What is the gift that he gave? His only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we all have access to Jesus And and here's the thing, in Jesus is every gift you would ever need. Please write it down. I don't know if it's on the screen. In Jesus is every gift you would ever need. In Jesus 
is every gift you will ever need. And we all have Jesus. Now, if you're in here tonight and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to give you the opportunity to do that in just a couple minutes. And I only have a few minutes to, to teach you and share my heart. But, but so we want to listen quick and understand that, that we all have the same gift. And it's all in Jesus. And everything else is contained in that gift. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, says that your life is hidden in Christ Jesus. Your life is hid in Christ Jesus. Galatians 2.20 says that it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. See, we've been talking about this. We can't allow ourselves to live a life that just knows, okay, as a Christian, I'm going to heaven and I'm not going to hell. But, but, but absolutely, while I'm here on earth, there's no change. There's no culture shift. There's no lifestyle switch um, in me versus an unbeliever. There should be a difference in following Christ or in following Jesus or in being a Christian. That means I accept the person of Jesus as my life. Write these verses down. They're not on the screen. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 5. Talk about what Jesus did on the cross. And Jesus didn't just pay for your sin on the cross, but, but he paid for, in essence, the curse. See, when God made Adam and Eve, and we've talked about this over the last several months, the Bible says that God blessed them. But when they disobeyed, they brought a curse on themselves. They partnered with the enemy. They believed a lie. And from that moment forward, all mankind, as they would be born out of Adam and Eve, fell into or were born into what we like to call a fallen world or a sinful world. God created man, loved man, wanted man back in relationship with them. Those of you that have heard that song, um, what a beautiful name in the part that says, you know, you didn't want heaven without us. God made us because he wanted to love us and have fellowship with us. So he sent his only son to basically right Adam's wrong and to, to eliminate the curse from having a hold on mankind, literally to set us free. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm free. And if you're not tonight, again, if you've not received Jesus, we're going to give you a chance to be free. And so in buying us back in destroying the curse, the Bible refers to the curse as threefold. Okay. It contains these three things, meaning all of these things are the effect or the, or, or the effect, again, of disobedience, okay? Write them down, poverty, sickness, and death. Those are curses. Those aren't gifts. God doesn't have sickness, therefore he doesn't use sickness. God is not poor, therefore he does not use poverty. And God is life. Deuteronomy 30, 20 says, I, God says, I am your life in the length of days. God is life, meaning he does not kill. The enemy comes, John 10, 10, to kill, to steal, and destroy. And so recognizing that when I receive Jesus, the curse and the power of the curse and all the effects of the curse are broken off of my life. But just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I'm participating in all of the things that have been provided for me. It requires something of me. Remember, we've been looking at Romans 12, 1 and 2, um, where it says to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For any of you guys that have ever gone overseas into another country, you recognize the cultural differences, the language differences, lifestyle differences. I know a time in my life when I, I spent some time in France, you know, I hadn't bought Rosetta Stone. I didn't know the language. I was going to be with people who knew the language. So I didn't take it upon myself to learn the language. So honestly, for those two weeks that I was in France, I conducted myself like an American. Okay? I pointed. Okay? I didn't say that Pastor Kathy conducted herself like a Mexican, just being honest. She was born and raised in El Paso. And so I think she's kind of for real, a little bit Mexican, right? But, but yes in, in French is we, oui, and she kept saying si. That's Spanish. Everywhere we went. And I was like, seriously, Mom? Like, you're speaking Spanish. 
They don't speak Spanish. They speak French. But you understand. So we, she conducted herself for two weeks like a Mexican. I conducted myself for, for two weeks like an American. I was in a different place, but I still acted my old way. A lot of people that are in God's family live and act like that. Even though they're Christians, even though they've received Jesus, they still conduct themselves. They still do life like they did before they knew Jesus. That's a big part of the church's responsibility is to help you know how to live in God's family. That was a big part of Jesus' ministry. Remember, we looked at that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. What did Jesus say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That word repent means change your mind. His whole ministry was devoted to teaching people how to think like him how to think like a Christian. Because you know what? We've been programmed to think like the world thinks. We've been programmed, in essence, to think cursed thoughts, right? We're programmed to think sick thoughts. We're programmed to think poor thoughts. We're programmed to to rejection. We're programmed to not being good enough. And and we're programmed to fear. We're programmed to anxiety and depression. And, And here's the thing. Just because you've chosen Jesus as your Savior doesn't mean that you don't still have to choose life every single day after that. As long as you live. And a lot of it starts with understanding that when you got Jesus, you got everything else that you would ever need, that he is the gift. See, when we think of the word gift, like they're really gifted or they're really talented, right? And so we look at each other and we say, well, she's a really gifted dancer, I'm not. He's a really gifted in academics, like he's really smart, I'm not. He's really gifted athletically, I'm not. See, we value each other, and even our own selves by our gifts, right? The world does this same thing. So the world says, if you grow up, and, and, and you're indoctrinated in this, you're, what, what that means is this is how you're taught. Why do people say you should go to college? Because it's important to, to really embrace the fact that, that the average, or not the average, I think the, the most intelligent human being still only use, uses 10% of their mind. They only use 10%. Nobody says, hey, you should really go to college because you're so capable. You could be the next Albert Einstein. Nobody says that. They say, hey, you should really go to college because if you go to college, you'll make more money. Meaning, you'll be more valuable. Because somebody who goes to college, and listen, I'm not against college. I'm against the world's doctrine. Do you understand? Because the world's doctrine opposes biblical doctrine. Okay? So, So when you go to college, in essence, you're saying that you're worth X, Y, Z versus someone else who's not worth as much. Do you understand? And so the world will tell you you're more valuable if you're an athlete than if you're a janitor. You're more valuable if you are a singer and you make it big in Nashville or Hollywood or wherever than if you just sing on the worship team at your church. This is a value issue. And people make decisions. People in the world can do this all day long. But when people in the church do this, we have a problem. Because, see, your gifting is not what you can do. Your gift is the person of the Lord Jesus. And in the Lord Jesus is everything else. We all have the the same gift. In essence, it is Jesus. Now, just because we all have different assignments and different purposes doesn't mean that our value... Okay, here's the thing. I am, I'm anointed, I'm called of God to be in the ministry. Okay? So, in many cases, I am more gifted at this than anybody else in this room in the moment. So, does that mean I'm more valuable than anyone else in this room? No. 
My talent may be different. My assignment may be different. My purpose may be different. But we all share the same value. The Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the gift. He loves each and every one of us exactly the same. He's no respecter of persons. Now, people who live with this mentality, there's no competition. There's no competition. Do you understand that James 3.16 says that where there's strife, there's confusion in every evil work. Why do people get in strife? Why do people get in competition? Because they don't understand their value. They're warring for the best grades. They're warring for the best scholarship. They're warring for the solo. They're fighting for whatever they feel they need to be valuable. Honestly, what could you ever get? How much could you ever earn that would even begin to compare to the price of the life of the Lord Jesus? See, when you live your life understanding that he is the gift, there's no pride. There's no pride. Yeah, I have a different assignment than your assignment. I have a different purpose than your purpose. Maybe my purpose is on a platform with a microphone. But in the mind of God, your purpose is no more valuable or less valuable than mine. There's no reason to boast. Think about, and don't say it out loud, but just think about, maybe do it tonight. Think about the things that come natural to you. Maybe you're good with kids. Maybe you have a singing ability. Maybe you're really good at dance. Maybe you're really good at leading and getting everybody rallied around, you know, a mission. We're going to do this. Maybe you're the one that's always making the decisions in your group of friends. Maybe you're really, really good with the underdog, that you know how to make people feel special. Even the most, you know, outcast of the outcasts, you know how to reach out. Think about the things tonight, uh, and, and maybe they come up into your mind right away, that come natural to you. You know what I think about? Some of the things in my life that come natural to me. You know, it's easy for me to organize things. It's easy for me to lead. It's easy for me to look at a project that needs to be done and break it down into tasks, to look at the big picture and say, okay, let's do this, this, and this, and this. I've been doing that since I was a kid. It's, it's easy for me to sing. That's easy for me to do. That comes very natural to me. It's easy for me to speak, to stand up here and do what I'm doing right now. And do you realize that the things that come natural to you are not the things that you had anything to do with. Now, does that mean that I've never done vocal warm-ups? Does that mean that I've never stewarded what I've been given, like Matthew 25 talks about? No. Does that mean I wasn't in choir because I felt like I didn't need any training? No. Does that mean I didn't go to worship school? No. Does that mean I didn't go to Bible school? No. I stewarded all of those things. But those things aren't the gift in my life. Those are the purpose of my life. Those are the assignments. See, when you start looking at what you have as your means for security, as your means for fulfillment, you know, so, you know in this season of your life especially, you think, well, if I could just get to be this, then my life will be full, and then I'll be happy. It's a lie. It's a lie. Because... He's supposed to be your life. Now, you're going to have an assignment, and you're going to have a responsibility. And in, in, in being obedient in those things, there's going to be a certain element of peace and joy and security. But the, but the reality is it's all because of your relationship with him. Not because, because do you realize that I had nothing to do with an ability to sing? I had nothing to do with that. I had nothing to do with that. Some of you guys that pick up academics really, really fast, maybe you're really good at numbers. The things that come natural to you, you had nothing to do with. Those are from God. James 1.17 says every good and every perfect gift comes from God. He knew you while you were in your mother's womb. And everything good that's in you, he put it there. Because it's tied to your assignment. It's tied to your purpose. But here's what it's not tied to. It's not tied to to your prosperity. It's not tied to your peace. 
It's not tied to all of the things that you get in Jesus. If so, then Jesus isn't really who he says he is. If Jesus can only guarantee my heaven, but I'm going to have to work out my prosperity here, then he's not really all that. He's not really everything he said he is. If he is just my savior, but I'm still going to have to work it out and strain it out and force it out, meaning my joy, my peace, my healing on my own because I'm gifted or because I'm going to make enough money to be able to afford these things, then I don't think Jesus is really the gift that he said he is. If I have something to do with my prosperity, then what did he do? If I have something to do with my peace, then what did he carry? If I have something to do with being healthy and being happy and being whole, then what did he do? See, when you see Jesus as the gift, there's no competition, there's no pride, and there's no fear. I think if we were honest and we had the opportunity to cut each and every one of our brains open to really dissect the honest-to-goodness thoughts that we have, we spend more time in fear than we probably spend in anything. How am I going to have enough money? How am I going to be successful? How am I going to get into that school? How am I going to do this? How am I going to afford to go to this? How am I going to get enough money to buy this? How am I going to do this, and how am I going to do that? And here's the thing about that. You weren't wired for that. You weren't built for that. You are not capable of that. I don't ever sit down and look in my little dog's face and say, listen, write your name and sign the check. I'm going to drop you off at the vet and you need to pay your own bills. You need to get in there and you need to write the check. They're going to give you the, the stuff. You need, I don't ever do that to my dog because my dog can't write. Okay, she's an awesome dog, but she can't write a check. She doesn't know how to do that. She's not built for that. That's not in her. I don't ever sit down with my dog and say, listen, you need to wash your blanket. You need to put it in the wash, and you need to put, use bleach. I don't ever tell my dog to do her own laundry because she can't do her own laundry. She wasn't made for that. But what I can do is throw the ball. And she knows exactly what to do. And she brings it back. And I can train her when I put her bag on the floor to get in her bag because it's time to go. I can do that. Guys, I think sometimes we demand more of ourselves because we're too full of the world system. We demand more of ourselves than the Bible demands of us. We allow other people to put pressures and demands on us that God, God looks at all of us as his precious creation and just says, listen, I sent my son for you. Take him. Take him for everything that he is. The Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. He was made poor so that, he, so that we could be rich. He did all of those things. So when you recognize you have him, then this battle between others is over. The pride that comes from feeling like you got to stand out. Listen, I'm telling you right now, you better kick that in the butt right now while you live in a town of 45,000 people before you try to take that ego outside of the four walls of this county because you're going to fall on your face. Okay, there's a big world out there. And just because you're the star of this community doesn't mean you're going to shine anywhere else. That's not the deal. Now, that might be the deal for the world, but we don't have to live that way. I'm thinking about a girl right now. She was a year ahead of me in high school, and y'all, she was stellar. She was an amazing dancer. She was smart. She sang in our musicals that we would do back then for choir, and I was the backstage help because, y'all, that's, I, like, I like it. Like, I like, you know, get, and, and I remember standing backstage um, and she's closing out a scene with her co-star. And I'm back here, like, behind the curtain over there at Tidings. And I literally, and y'all know, because y'all know me, but little, little tears. Like, I'm like, she's so gifted. It was amazing. And so everybody's hyping her up, like, right? I mean, and, and, and for all intents and purposes, she, like, you're going to Broadway. And she did. And nobody knows her name right now. 
except the people that still have the program from high school. She didn't make it big, is what I'm saying. That's not our game. That's not our game anymore. And I'm not judging her. I'm not finding fault with her. I'm just telling you, you're going to have to decide. If you're a Christian, you're going to do things his way. That's not our game. That's not our game. This, we could, we could, I could list people on that whiteboard. Athletes. The whole nine. That better not be your game. You better not be making it all about you and what you can do. Because the reality is, you had very, very little to do with what you can do anyway. You might be stewarding something. And practicing something. But who gave you that something? And why did he give it to you? That's the question. What's the why behind your what? Why did God give us his only begotten son? First and foremost, so that we could have relationship with him. But then, so that we could serve mankind. First Peter 4.10, write it down. We're about to pray. It says... As each and every one of you has received a gift, you should use that gift to serve others. So in essence, in Jesus, and we'll let this cross represent Jesus. In Jesus is everything. Your peace, your prosperity, your joy. It's all in this gift. And as you receive him... Whatever assignment, that's really, and if you're in your Bible, I would love for you to make a note on 1 Peter 4.10, that word gift, put the word purpose or assignment. Because in Jesus, you have a purpose or an assignment. Peter calls it a gift. But we already know we all have the same gift, that is Jesus. And in and through Jesus, we all have a purpose or an assignment. And that purpose and that assignment is to be used to serve other people. Not to get your prosperity. Because if you have to get your prosperity through your purpose and your assignment, what did he get? Not to get your peace and your fulfillment. Because if your peace and your fulfillment comes from your assignment, then what did he get? Do you understand? We make too much of what we do or what we should do, or even trying to figure out what we're supposed to do. And if you'll just make much of Jesus. God, I'm so thankful for Jesus. And I want to learn about Jesus. When you understand the gift that Jesus is for your life, then he can begin to talk to you about your assignment and your purpose. But James 4, 6 says that God opposes the proud. And gives grace to the humble. I think if we were honest, many young people go before God in their quiet time in a a desperation to find out what's the next step for me. With this attitude that says, God, I know you've called me to do this and this and this. Or I'm good at this and this and this. And so show me where I need to be to do this and this and this. And I think honestly, a father who sees the beginning from the end would have hands tied with a child who comes to him and says, hey, listen, this is what I'm good at. So how are you going to take care of me? Where do you want me to go so that I can be good at what I'm good at? And I can make a lot of money because this is what I'm good at. I think that to our father would absolutely tie his hands. But instead, when a young person came before God and said, Father, I love you. You are my life. I can't do anything or go anywhere or be anything without you. You are the distinction of my life. And so, Father, with with that knowledge, I'm authorizing you to lead me. And, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I've had multiple conversations with a father like that. I'll never sing again. I'll never preach again. I'll I'll never do any of the things that people may perceive to be the things that I need to do. I'll clean toilets for the rest of my life. I'll do whatever you want me to do because you are my prosperity. Not a college degree, not a certain paying job, not a rich husband. You know what I'm saying? I used to sit with girls in lunch that were going to marry somebody rich. You are my everything, Jesus. You're not just my heaven because heaven's the biggest deal, guys. Heaven's way bigger deal 
than a new car down here. You understand? So if he can get you heaven, he'll take care of everything else. God, so my life is yours. You are the gift of my life. I want you to go ahead and open the gift that you have. Every single one of you, and you don't have to talk to do that because I'm still preaching. Every single one of you have gifts that might be different. There may be a couple of you that have something similar. But the fact is, in every single present, the same price was paid. I don't know if I should squelch your joy or just smile. In every single present, the same price was paid. Meaning, every gift was one dollar. Every gift was one dollar. Now, if, you, if your gift is not your favorite, trade after, okay? Every gift was one dollar. Okay, and again, if your gift is not your favorite, trade with someone after. What does that mean? You're all worth the same. You're all gonna do different things. Some of you may, may be in ministry. Some of you may be in business. Some of you may own a business. Some of you may work for another man's business. But in Christ Jesus, do you know that prosperity is available for every single one of you? No matter what your purpose is no matter what your assignment is, that peace is available for you, no matter what your purpose is, no matter what your assignment is, that being full in life is not based on how many followers you have on social media or a label picking you up for their cosmetics, that that's not where it's at, that you will never be more valuable than the price of the Lord Jesus, regardless of your assignment. And when you accept him as the gift, you can take your assignment, put it in its proper place in your heart and in your life, and get on your knees as we'll see next week that Jesus did and begin to serve. Thank you again for listening. If this message has meant something to you, we would love to hear from you. Please contact us at info at choosefehops.com. At Choose Life, the word is the most important. So check back weekly for more encouraging messages just for teenagers.